Good evening, everyone. I'm Pat Moore, Chair of the Quality of Life Committee meeting. This is our January meeting. Tonight we have lots of things going on in the community, and so we're down some members, and also our co-chair, Mary, um, Mariama James, will not be joining. She might come late, but probably not. So we're going to start the meeting. Um, so Thomas and Jared, hi, how are you? Welcome. Uh, Thomas and Jared, you should be able to unmute yourselves. Oh, Jared S. I see you do have a, um, let me move Jared S. over. Give me one second. I thought I had those guys moved over, but I didn't. Let me see. Make. Okay, Jared, you should be able to unmute now and Thomas, you're able to unmute as well. Hello. Hi. Dave. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so take it away. Introduce yourselves. Hi. Sure. Um, so we're here on behalf of the now 100 person strong Tribeca North Neighborhood Association, which is a uh, group that was uh, born in the last year, really uh, started initially planting trees around the Holland Tunnel Rotary. We you know, banded together uh, and funded and planted nine uh, replacement trees that died during the pandemic. And from that uh, began talking about uh, the, you know, the one thing that 100 people in New York can actually agree on, uh, which is traffic and uh, the traffic in this neighborhood specifically. So thanks to the chair uh, for having us back on the agenda. We spoke, I believe, in September. Uh, and thanks, Lucian, for helping guide us as always. Uh, you know, for those unaware, you know, this, you know, issue is really just about the total mayhem that's around the Holland Tunnel during uh, high traffic hours uh, and really the near total breakdown of service delivery relating to it. You know, basically, in short, it's become unreasonably unsafe to uh, cross the street as a pedestrian in the area. Cars blow through lights, they block crosswalks, they block the box. Uh, we've seen things on a regular basis, you know, cars driving the wrong way down one-way streets, uh, motorcycles on the sidewalk, all sorts of uh, craziness. Uh, you know, since the fall meeting, we've been working on this uh, you know, pretty consistently. We had a, uh, a lot of incoming interest really from uh, people in the neighborhood. The 100 people was all incoming, uh, which I think speaks to the sort of you know unity around this particular issue. Uh, we had a solid meeting in December at the first precinct community council meeting about the issue. And while Captain Smith and his team were very receptive, truth be told, we we're essentially in the same place right now as we have been. Uh, and this you know just is not idle you know complaining about traffic. Uh, we recognize that it comes with the territory. Of living in this area, it's really about the total and complete disregard of traffic laws, the lack of the will you know, by the city to enforce any of those laws, um, or really even install any basic pedestrian safety measures that we've requested through normal channels, such as additional signage or repainting the crosswalks. Uh, in short, this is not just an NYPD issue. It's not just a DOT issue. It's not just a Port Authority issue. Uh, it, it it's impacted and uh, you know really by each of those agencies. Uh, and nobody really seems to want to touch it. And so uh, here I am in January raising the same issue, same question really that we, we raised in the fall, which is what are we waiting for here? Like, are we waiting for a kid to get hit crossing the street? Because that's what it seems in all of our conversation that it's gonna have to come to for there to be any sort of movement on this. And so you know, we bring this to this, this committee again, um, sort of you know, with our hands in the air asking, what do we do? Because we cannot seem to get any actual meaningful traction or movement on sort of the basics. Jared, did did so in September when when Officer Iordano was here, he said that he was going to move a traffic person over to that area during the times, you know, the worst times. Did he ever do that? So there has been somebody which start which has been inconsistent uh, at one intersection, but it, it's it's a much bigger issue than that. I think uh, in others, I hope others you know who are here you know can speak up about this as well. It, it's you know it, it's like putting a band aid on a you know bazooka wound. It's just it's not. That's never going to you know you know be the solve really. And here we are you know about to undergo a two plus year overnight shutdown of the Holland Tunnel and all the madness around it, and we can't even see, seem to get basic services during you know normal conditions. Um, it's it's pretty alarming. 
Would you tell us about the two year shutdown for the Howland Tunnel? Sure, uh, the Port Authority put out a uh, press release yesterday. It was in the Times today, I believe. Uh, it is, you know, for the last, you know, several years, they've been doing sandy repairs on the Manhattan bound uh, tube of the Holland Tunnel. Uh, and starting, I believe, and you know, somebody can correct me, I believe February 5th uh, is going to start uh, overnight repairs from, I want to say, 11 o'clock at night till 530 in the morning, six days a week uh, through 2025. And sort of out of nowhere this week, temporary uh, construction signs announcing that the tunnel, you know, would be shut down um, have gone up on Hudson. Uh, but that's the first anybody, you know, it's the first I've heard of it at least. I don't know if others are more dialed in, but but it was news to me. Uh, Betty, are you here? And I'm sorry to do this, Betty. If you don't, if you don't mind. Betty? Yeah, sorry. I was cleaning my glasses. <laughs> oh. uh, Betty is the chair of our transportation committee. Betty, do you know about the shutdown for the Howland Tunnel? Yes. Okay. Do you think that that this topic should be moved into your committee? Uh, no, because these are typically quality of life issues. That doesn't mean ultimately there won't be something for transportation, but at this point, they're talking quality of life issues. Can I, may I? So, part of it is quality of life, but part of it, and this is where I think it does, you know, infringe a little bit on transportation. You know, the crosswalks have not been consistently repainted. The box blocking uh, diagrams on the on the street have not been uh, repainted. There are traffic lights that are out. We've made the request, even you know, forget about the police portion of this, the enforcement portion or the traffic control, the actual sort of basic DOT you know, elements of the streetscape, which wouldn't solve the problem, but would be a step in the right direction. Just getting some attention on this, you know, we can't even seem to, to get any traction on. Now, Jared, I'm going to ask you, and this is, requires some work. And Thomas, are you there? Your hundred plus members of your your group i'm going to ask you if you would do a little homework and do a report and send us photographs of the lights that are not working photographs of the crosswalks that need to be repainted you know with the exact locations so we have a little you know a little packet sure. of information that we that, that you know lucian and betty and i can then maybe get some traction lucian Jump in. Yeah, uh, I think that's that's a great idea, Pat. Um, and then we can forward that right to DOT. Um, but you know, the, the interesting thing here is that this is a this is a crossover where you have a port authority asset uh, that DOT has has a you know jurisdiction over much of the streets that are heading towards uh, this asset. And uh, if you know enforcement and line painting only get so far, then I would say that there's a point where we need to think about more durable modifications that will bring relief. Um, the tunnel isn't going away, that's for sure. Uh, however, um, you know, I would say that uh, Jared could tell you that the neighbors have, you know, made a lot of progress through these discussions. Um, but I think there's a lot more progress that could be made. Um, but the, the question is, what do durable changes look like? How you know how large scale, and those are certainly questions that um, will require, I think, a, a broader look at you know the the facility itself and the streets leading to and from it. So that's that. I don't know where when we get to that point, but I do think that it, it is uh, worthwhile to see that in the in the horizon. Now the other question, Lucian, is do we have um, a, a representative from our council members? Is someone from? Christopher Marte's office here with us tonight? No, not tonight. Okay. So I, I suggest we also get them looped in if possible. So we and do have a representative from the mayor's office here with us tonight. Okay. Uh, so, and, and so welcome Andrew Kunkes from the CAU. I'm sorry. Hey. Oh, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Welcome. Hey, Pat. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming. So did you happen to catch what this issue is? Yeah, so I'm not too familiar, so I don't want to really go go too deep into this, but 
I am open to taking whatever resolutions or suggestions that Community Board 1 has, putting them forth to the mayor, putting them forth to DOT and the Port Authority as well, because as Lucian said, this is an issue that's not going away. We want to make sure everything's done as amicably and with as much community input as possible. So we know the Holland Tunnel has always been kind of an issue, but as the community has grown around it, and there are lots of kids, you know, and, and, and people crossing streets, uh, Jared, we're going to let you take it away. Can you just give us a, a brief dis, uh, description of what's going on over there? The chaos that you guys are living with. Uh, yeah, no, for sure. It, it's, it's really just been a, um, it, it has devolved in the post you know, pandemic era. Really? Uh, it's always been crazy. There's no question about it, but, you know, there were regular, uh, traffic enforcement officers posted, which, you know, you know, nothing is better than, you know, human, you know, intervention that really went away. Um, you know, we fought pretty hard and got 1 person back. You know, what we, you know, conversation that we had with the 1st precinct was. You know, an understandable 1, which is that resources are stretched really thin. We've gone to them and said, we appreciate that. You know, we respect it. But we're asking you to to uh, reallocate your resources in a way that that it addresses the issue um, and be more resourceful with them ultimately. Um, because, you know, for a 5 block, you know, span from canal on south. You have 1 person that doesn't accomplish it. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, what we've seen, as I mentioned you know, earlier, is everything from, you know, constant accidents, fist fights breaking out between drivers, um, cars driving the wrong way down one way streets. You know, they put up these plastic bollards up Hudson that tries to delineate the traffic to the tunnel from traffic going north. You know, they might as well not, you know, they serve some benefit, but people drive right over them. Um, you know, it's really just not what you sort of expect and hope in a you know, a civilized society in this, you know, in sorry to interrupt. Please. So what time is twice a day that you have this happen, right? It's really what once hour? a day. It's really I'm once sorry. a day. It's and what's the time frame? It's roughly from as early as two o'clock in the afternoon to about eight o'clock in the evening. And then That's Saturdays. Yeah. And then Saturdays and Sundays in the summer, it's more of a daytime issue as people are heading out of the city. So not only do you have fist fights and people going the wrong direction, do you have people laying on their horns for long periods of time? Is it Absolutely. impossible for kids to nap and sleep? Is it impossible? So your quality of life is being pretty impacted, is what it sounds like. For sure. And but I, you know, to take it just a step further, those are inconveniences of city life. You know, this is an impossibility to safely cross the street because they are jockeying for position in a way that is so aggressive uh, with each other. That they don't really care what's in front of them, and there's nobody. You know, the police are not. You know, with all due respect, they're not ticketing. You know, there's no enforcement block in the box. There's no enforcement block in the crosswalk. You know, for God's sake, um, it's just a free for all, and it's everybody's had it. And up it's also here. bigger than just the police officers trying yes. to manage this. One hundred percent. It's that's sort of what I'm saying. It's not the NYPD. It's not the Port Authority. It's not the DOT. It's everybody refusing to lean in on this. So, Andrew, it is a safety issue as well as a quality of life issue. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's a pretty big issue and it is the Holland tunnel is, as, as Lucian said earlier, is not going away. It's been there. You know, for a 100 years, and of course, when it opened, we had far less traffic than we have now. And every year we have an increase in traffic and every year we have an increase in the population living in the area surrounding. The Holland Tunnel exit. So we're asking, please, what can you do to help? And and just to stress, this is the one section of the Holland Tunnel approach or exit that is almost exclusively residential. I know I'm pretty familiar with um, with the area. I left the city last weekend, and it took me about an hour to go, maybe three blocks. So I'm very familiar with some of these frustrations. Having seen it firsthand. I could only imagine what it's like to live with it day in and day out. Um, I think this is a conversation that we're going to have to have with the traffic patrol and Manhattan South, not just the first precinct on how we might be able to reallocate some officers to this area because it is uh, an issue that's gotten out of control with less people riding public transportation and driving cars. So I definitely think if you have any recommendations, any suggestions on what might work best, the mayor loves to hear 
directly from the citizen. So we'd love to, you know, share those those suggestions with him. But certainly, in the meantime, we're going to have a conversation with uh, Manhattan South Patrol Borough and make sure we can get some additional folks there just in the interim to help with, uh, with some of the traffic flow. And maybe we could get some more enforcement with some of the honking and some of the blocking of the box and and crosswalks. That that would be that would be great because you know under previous administrations, you know, not immediately preceding, but in in the past. Those were quality of life issues that were really focused on, uh, and there'd be a benefit to that. The thing I'll say is what we've heard a lot from um, the NYPD is that this is the uh, has the most number of traffic enforcement agents of anywhere in the city, save for the Lincoln Tunnel. I think that's not exactly correct. I think it, they are largely north or west, but none on on Hudson Street South. Um, and as far as uh, an outline, we have a lengthy letter that we prepared after the last meeting, at the last um, uh, quality of life meeting. That outlines beat by beat sort of exactly what we were experiencing, what we think, you know, some some holistic suggestions could be, and we'd really like the opportunity to present that. Okay, so I think it's great if you come up with the photographs of the intersections and photographs of the traffic. And even if you get some sound effects, the horns blowing and people yelling and cursing each other out. Everything is everything at get a packet together. We want a powerful presentation from your 100 plus members. And then Andrew can will arrange. Do you would you like just the packet or would you like to have some of the residents attend this meeting? Yeah, you know, I'll definitely I'll drop the uh, the chat in or the link in the chat in a minute where you could if you want to, uh, you know, pitch this to the mayor, you can schedule something directly with him. He might be open to meeting with you guys. He might end up just uh, kicking it over to me to take, but uh, certainly want to give you that opportunity to do so. Um, but yeah, I think that this definitely warrants a larger conversation. And I think that these are issues, particularly with uh, the construction starting soon, that we want to make sure get nipped in the bud. Okay, thank you. So we've got a couple of questions. We got some hands up. Lucian, you have your hand. Do you have your hand up? Yeah, just really quick. I just wanted to say that um, you know, anytime there's a large change, it's an opportunity uh, to observe. Um, so for the, the closure uh, of the evening hours. Of the Holland Tunnel, it's an opportunity for the DOT, and I know that they're going to look at the data, but they're going to capture the, the change in pattern, what happens, uh, how vehicles are rerouting. Um, I think there's a really good opportunity to look at and study those those patterns of how um, automobiles are changing their practices when it's closed, but also uh, to look at um, the way that the the neighborhood changes when those vehicles are no longer. Uh, using Hudson Street as they approach. So I, I think that if we, we take these years to kind of look at what's better about that during those hours, um, there's a way to visualize how to capture, recapture that that kind of feeling by, you know, you know by thinking bigger about it. But, um, you know, it happened during the pandemic where people got to see what the streets were like when there were fewer vehicles uh, in terms of noise, that in terms of lovely. quality of life. Uh, and then, you know, even, you know, streets like near me, they rebuilt part of Park Avenue in East Harlem and they shut down both sides and there was no traffic either way. And the way that people used the streets was different. And it wasn't, you know, it, we got to see that it wasn't like a, a, a traffic apocalypse. Um, so, you know, it's, it's those sorts of things that um, I really urge you to, 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 to observe uh, closely. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Lucian. So Diane Stein, Marianne and Mimi. Uh, not a question, but a comment. Um, I walk as I walk home from 200 Varick Street almost every weekday, and I can just, I, I mean, the cars on on Varick Street going to the Holland Tunnel, it's like, I, you know, starting from like three in the afternoon on, it's just, an, it's it's just crazy. And I, I used to cross on Va Canal Street on Varick Street, and it was just too. It was kind of too scary. So now I go over to Hudson where at least there's usually a, tra a traffic manager, but, you know, I could just attest to the, to the mayhem. Thank you, Diane. Marianne. I just wonder if the mayor would like to come sometime during a busy time and actually see what's happening. And that might help get proper attention on the problems there. Yeah, in my conversations, once we we have a little bit more of a robust proposal, we'll definitely 
requests that he goes out and do a walkthrough. We'll also request to uh, DOT Commissioner Udonis Rodriguez, and also see you know if we can get some of our our Port Authority partners um, as well. Great, thanks. Good suggestion, Marianne. Mimi, you're muted. We can't hear you. Oh, now we hear you. I don't, you know, I don't work with them or anything. <laughs> I so I've um, where do I leave, leave off? Right. I haven't driven through the Holland Tunnel in a while because I try to avoid Manhattan as much as humanly possible when I'm actually driving a vehicle. Um, but in the past, when you know taking directions from Google, Google routes me through what appears to be the craziest ways to get to the Holland Tunnel. And then with the, the traffic control um, cones, et cetera, um, I have to like turn around and try to figure out my own way to get to the tunnel. Um, you know, and Google's just like turn around and it's just very difficult and frustrating. Um, and I just can't help but wonder if the level of frustration that I experienced is exactly what, what these people are experiencing in their, they're just like, you know, I don't know how to get anywhere. The city's really confusing. And there's these cones up and Google doesn't seem to know about them. And I have to rewrite my, route myself. And like, I don't even think like that anymore. Right. And so, um, is there, does that still happen now? A, eh? and if it does still happen, is there any way possible to work with Google to, you know, show like current traffic patterns or, um, or can we, if, I don't know, I don't actually know. I think my understanding just as a user is that both Google and ways, which they own pull real-time traffic data. So, you know, there's, you know, it, I, I hear you on that, but it's, I think it does actually factor that in into the routing. Yeah, but it, the port authority can, against... can talk to ways and tell them okay. to, 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 to not do, to not serve certain routes to users to get to the tunnel. And the, in the past, um, I've, I worked with the port authority to, 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 have them like reduce like going on Jimmy's outside anyway to to reduce like the um, the priority of certain streets uh, versus other but it is a zero sum game when you have multiple streets kind of feeding uh, one facility. Lucian, to your point, I think you know there are sort of two separate things that we're talking about here, right? There's the short term solution, which is just sort of reining in some of the 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 mayhem, right? What's beyond typical traffic, and then there's planning you know, for the long term, which is figuring out what is a long term solution here. The tunnel is not going anywhere, but as we've seen in other areas, as you've seen on Hudson Street north of Canal Street, that wonders can be done when you're thinking creatively about what the streetscape should look like, whether that's greenery, whether that's extended curbs, you know, whatever that may be. You know, with what the Hudson Square bid has done north of Canal Street on on Hudson Street is remarkable if you haven't been over there. They widened the sidewalks, they put in what will be an amazing canopy of trees. It's really, really impressive. But it, you know, even that, you know, it shows you a, a glimpse in what you're able to do with medians, with dedicated bus lanes, et cetera, et cetera. And it's probably an issue that would be well served Hudson, Varick, and Canal Street, not just one. That whole area is cancerous at the moment. All right, and so I think we need to stress, as we have said, the safety issues, and then secondly, the quality of life issues. First and foremost, it is a life safety issue, no question right. about it. Thank Thomas, you. Thomas, did you want to say anything? I no, I mean, I I think Jared's uh, Jared's done a very good job of been very eloquent of uh, yes. stating my concerns and and the concerns of other people in in the neighborhood. And uh, we look forward to working with you in the mayor's office and in trying to find, you know, short term solutions and kind of long term solutions to the issue. Right. And then also, gentlemen, on that, you know, packet that you're going to put together, if people don't mind, can you give us the 100 names and where they live as in a petition so that the mayor's office can see that these are real people that live in the community? And if you can get more than 100 names. Great, 
and then you know we'll work with Andrew. Andrew, thank you so much. We'll work with Andrew and uh, and Lucian and and try to get this meeting set up for you. Perfect. Thank you so much. You've got two oh, uh, wait, we have, hands yes. up in the attendee section, and of course, Officer Holman. Yes, Officer Holman, thank you for coming. Welcome. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. I uh, I know you're about to end it. I just want to mention that uh, at our community council meeting on the 26th, it's going to be uh, via Zoom. We're going to have the CO or the commanding officer of the Holland Tunnel here, uh, well, in the meeting. So if you guys want to, you know, reach out and be present and you know have your voices heard. Uh, the guy on the other side of the tunnel is going to be there, and uh, Officer Iordano, he could make it, obviously, and uh, Officer Ford. So they kind of uh, gave me some information about the enforcement being done at the tunnel. And uh, the traffic agents are, their tours are changing so that they can uh, enforce uh, more traffic infractions at the tunnel. I wish I had the numbers here to let you know what they were, but, uh, you know, we're, we're trying our best at the precinct level to address the concerns you guys are having. Okay, so again, I'm just going to reiterate that the first precinct council meeting is the 26th. That's a Thursday at six o'clock, and it's via Zoom. And uh, we have the information that uh, you know you can get from Lucian, or you can Officer Holman. If you want to, do do you have that Zoom link with you right now that we could put in the uh, chat? I know it always. Uh, we always have it available on the uh, Twitter page, the first precinct Twitter page. Uh, to get it right now. Okay, that would be great. I'll drop it in the uh, chat if I can. Thank you. Great, and I'll send it to we everyone. Should, that possible? Also, Thank you so much. So, Jared and Thomas, I hope that you know this has been helpful. Very much Please so. Thank tell you. Your, tell your other ninety-eight members of your your group that you know we're trying our best to help you, and that Andrew has taken his evening to be here tonight to, and we'll is going to try to help you get a meeting with the mayor. We really appreciate it. We appreciate being put on the agenda and thank you. Yeah, and Pat, you've got a hand, two hands up. You have Darlene Lutz and Trina Quagliari. Um, oh, Darlene, hi. Darlene, Darlene, I'm requesting unmute. You can unmute yourself. Hi, Pat. Uh, happy Hello. New Year, everybody. Uh, sorry, I'm happy not turning New on year. Have, I'm not turning on my camera. I didn't get, you know, my war paint on. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I am Darlene Lutz. I am the vice president of the first precinct community council. I am a resident of community board two, but just north on Varick, uh, just uh, north of Canal on Varick Street, um, where I have lived over uh, for the past over 40 years. Um, to, uh, Holland Tunnel traffic is my game, um, always. Uh, so, you know, nothing new about the noise um, <laughs> and all that. Um, I just want to, uh, you know, we'll talk more at the first precinct meeting about this um, uh, uh, next week. Uh, so please all attend, you know, the nigglies about the, the Holland Tunnel traffic that we're always trying to figure out. Um, but I did want to say that community board two did have a meeting with the port authority on the north tunnel shutdown. That's the outbound tunnel from New York to Jersey, um, which is commencing on, I think it's either February 4th or 5th. Tune into 1010 wins. They'll give it to, you know, they'll, they'll be announcing that. Yeah, the signage is going up. That's what we're looking at right now. Um, members of the community to make sure that, you know, it is adequate uh, to reroute the traffic uh, overnight. Uh, so we don't get, you know, bunches of it clinging around trying to figure out where they're going. Um, the Port Authority also said it was working with Google Maps, Waze, which also Waze, part of Google, um, to get that closure in there so when people are following in real time which most of them are that they will know to divert um that's about all i know about that um and uh i do have a contact for the port authority now uh i will be getting in their presentation the pdf which i'll forward to uh lucian so he can have a look at it 
and uh, we'll try and go from there. Thank you for Great. giving me Darlene, the time. Thanks so much. Okay. See you at the uh, first precinct meeting. Well, I look forward to it, Pat. And again, happy new year, everybody. Happy new year. Um, there was someone else, and then Marianne again. Who was the other yeah, person? Trina Quagliaroli. Uh, you can unmute yourself now. There, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I'm Trina Qualiaroli, and I'm a 20 year resident of uh, the area of Watts and Greenwich Street. And I really appreciate all the attention to this and um, Jared making so many great points. Um, I find that I've been in many of these conversations and I find that the area in which I live and the traffic pattern that's heading um, west to east primarily on canal approaching the entrance seems to be a bit neglected in many of these conversations. So um, I'm not quite sure why we don't have the same level of representation or attention, but I just want to be sure that um, the, our concerns of this from this area are included in this conversation and I uh, would love to be involved in any conversation with the mayor. Um, as Jared pointed out, it is lawless. <laughs> um, and, and the safety concern, obviously, is the um, most important. You cannot cross safely um, south uh, across canal uh, at Greenwich Street. You just cannot. And um, additionally, you know, I, I feel like it's sort of the third rail of conversation, the quality of life issue, which safety is a quality of life issue, but so is some level of peace um, in your living space, which we have not had for years upon years upon years. And if you cannot afford thousands and thousands of dollars uh, to change out all you change out your windows you're kind of left with a whole lot of stress. Um, and I think that that is as important as the safety issue, because honestly, it's a mental health issue and um, it's really impacting a lot of the residents. And I think I that totally we understand you. we live in a city, um, but we do also, we should also have the expectation that laws can be followed and uh, enforcement is present and that we have the right to live with some degree of peace. I've yeah. lived there 20 years, it's, we, we've had it. And this is not just a pandemic thing, by the way, they will say it's the resources from the pandemic. It's been going on uh, quite some time. <laughs> Um, so, anyway, I would just love to make sure uh, if Jared or whomever can make sure that that section of the neighborhood is not neglected in this conversation, because it's a big part of that that jam up there and it is extremely dangerous, um, even on our individual little street uh, to cross at any time. Thank you. Appreciate uh, being heard. Great points, great points. And Andrew's going to try to get a meeting with the mayor. And so make sure that Lucian has your contact information because I think you should represent that part of of the of the issue. <laughs> All right. Trina, I, I just put my email in the chat. So please feel free to email me and then um, I can put you in contact with any other neighbors who are working on this issue. So you all can be united. The more voices. And uh, yeah, are you part of Jared's uh, group? 100 plus group? Trina? Well, Trina's, um, not, she's muted, but um, okay. Trina, you're, please feel free to email me um, and we'll, we'll make sure that your, your voice is amplified. Um, all right, uh, Pat, I'm going to put the uh, agenda back up. Okay, no, the last person is Marianne. Oh, sorry about that. I heard mention of a petition. I can reach out to a lot of seniors by email. So, if we have a petition that needs signatures, I could get that out there. Okay, so, um, Jared, also, if you don't mind, put your contact and give Lucian your contact information. Let's get everybody connected. Yeah. And, and everybody working on this issue. More people, just a, the better. And just a quick hello to Officer Holman. I haven't seen you since before COVID. So, nice to see you again. And uh, 
Glad to see you're still busy in our precinct. Thanks. Great. All right. So, Jarrett Thomas, we're going to end it there. Oh, sorry. Betty has something to say. Got to let Betty talk. Hello, Betty. Hi. Sorry. I just want to remember because in the past it came up, there is a group just north of Canal Street, but in that area that is for low vision and blind individuals. So, if Lucian could recall the name of that person, that was the contact person who spoke up last time. I think it's really important to include them in the conversation because they specifically spoke about Canal Street being a nightmare for their clients that come to visit as well as those that live locally. The crossing the streets, exactly. Thank you, Betty. That's sure. absolutely true. Exactly. All right. And also anyone who any groups that we had that have spoken about the disabled crossing the street and issues of crossing the street. So, okay, great, great. This is coming together nicely. All right. Thank you. So, as soon as everybody can get all the information together, Andrew um, will reach out. You know, you'll let us know. I don't know how it's going to work. Who's going to let whom know first? But, but Jared, you know, try to get that packet together. We'll do. Thank you very yeah. much. For the time. And, and Pat, I put in the chat for Lucian uh, the the link to request a meeting with the mayor and Lucian. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing that around with folks, um, anybody they have uh, an issue they'd like to speak with the mayor about, feel free to, to enter Thank it there. Thank you so much. Now, Andrew, you're staying, aren't you, for the rest of the meeting? I'm staying, and it looks like, looks like I'm going to have a few uh, other items to speak on as well. Okay, great. So, <laughs> so, I mean, Thomas and Jared, you're welcome to stay. If you're not, then thank you for coming, and we look forward to continuing and hopefully getting some resolution in this this problem. Okay. Thank, thank you for having us. Happy New Year. You thank too. you so much. All right. So the next item on our agenda, I think, uh, Lucian, are we able to do the vendors item? Yes, but sorry, I'm just turning around okay. Okay. Uh, Andrew's link that he sent. Um, just so everyone look at the chat, if you want the link uh, to con try to contact the mayor to request a, 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 for the mayor meet with you or do a walkthrough, um, it's in the chat. And if you're unable to see the chat, uh, then please reach out to me via email and I will send this link to you via email. Uh, so Could you just, yes. when you get a chance, send it to the board, the committee members so that we have it? Sure, sure. You have a moment. Um, Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Pat. That's a great idea. Uh, thank so you. for the the second item, Pat, um, we have um, the, the committee can go ahead and, uh, but we we also invited the uh, Street Vendors Project to be here um, to make sure that the, uh, uh, the representation of the of the vendors is uh, also uh, present. Are they here? Yes, uh, I think Matthew. I see Matthew. I can move Matthew Shapiro over to panelists. Okay, and who brought this topic to the committee? Do you know uh, I, I, I think it was is one of those uh, items that was that the, you and Mariama had been kind of discussing off and on. Uh, okay, so then I'll take it away. I, yeah, I was hoping that whoever brought it to our attention would be oh, would yes. address it, but I'm gonna take it away. So, Matt, oh, um, who, who is that? Issue? Francis, the, hey, vendor Francis. Is, the vendor issues on the Brooklyn mm -hmm. Bridge, is that what you're talking about? Yes. I believe that it came up first in transportation and, and um, they were looking at the fact that it's hard, you know, the traffic on the Brooklyn Bridge and we were looking at which precincts control uh, uh, that area and found out that the on the the Brooklyn precincts controlled this side and we weren't clear in terms of what um the precincts on the Manhattan side controlled but the issue was the fact that the traffic <clears throat> on even with the new bike lane on, on on the roadway which people who drive have problems with the issue on the walkway is 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 difficult, especially for people who have mobility issues. That that was, I think, that's what when it came up, and right. um, the reason, in addition to the traffic, that the vendors were becoming well multiplying, 
and they were just stretching further and further along the walkway, which again prevented the space for people to walk both ways. So, I, and created I, that's what a dangerous I remember. situation. Yes, yeah. that's exactly right. Thank you, Francis, for stating yeah. that. Yes. So there are a couple of issues we didn't know. We found out, and um, for Officer Holman, you can help us with this. That. Brooklyn, a Brooklyn precinct is in control of the pedestrian walkway. Is that correct on the bridge? Yes, uh, the Brooklyn bridge is run by the 8-4 precinct, uh, which, you know, that doesn't mean much when, you know, you start where all the vendors are, it's three feet from Manhattan, basically. Uh, but they, they are in charge of the enforcement and the bridge. If there's a, you know, an emotion disturbed person who's a jumper, they typically get the response. They have a car station on their side and that responds, you know, quickly. They'll have scooters, bicycles, depending on, you know, time of year, obviously. Um, as far as uh, we're concerned, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like a three-way intersection. The bridge itself is the 8-4 precinct. Uh, when you come from the uh, east side of Center Street behind City Hall, that's the 5th precinct. On the west side, you know, encompassing City Hall itself, is us here in the first precinct. Um, I know the, the majority of the issues are what takes place on the bridge and, and crossing it, uh, like I said, 8-4, but when it comes to things like uh, the, the vendors uh, illegally parking like box trucks and whatnot, that's on us. And I know uh, the command, uh, CO, Captain Smith, he did a towing operation, you know, trying to keep in order and uh, remove some of the trucks that were there. Um, but yeah, that's how it breaks down. A4 has bridge itself, east side, fifth precinct, west side, first precinct. We also heard about the porta potty. Yes, uh, I was there for the porta potty. So, uh, Officer Yordano, Officer Ford, and myself, and uh, Officer Rafalski, evidently, uh, the porta potty was on the bridge. Uh, for whatever reason, he decided to take it off the bridge, bring it right up to City Hall Park fence. We spoke to the to the, the guy who was running it and a really charismatic guy. He believed that there there's a need for a porta potty and it was He's up to right. him to accept uh, donations in a big trash can. And obviously, you know, you can't set up porta potties and any other type of structure, be it for charitable purposes or or a business. So uh, while we were interacting with him, the the parks enforcement police, because technically that little that little piece next to City Hall, that's considered Parks Department property, too, to get into more mm. jurisdictions. Uh, and th they came out and they summonsed him and everything was removed. You know, he was able to remove his porta potties himself. As far as I know, he hasn't come back. Um, I can't, I can give you a date the last time I saw the guy. Uh, hold on, give me a second. So for those of you who didn't quite get it, an entrepreneurial spirit set up a porta potty as a little business right by the entrance of the Brooklyn Bridge, wow. which is illegal and also part of the traffic jam. Yeah, uh, that was the, last, the last time I saw him was the ninth. That was the day he was summoned. Uh, he was given an old summons by the Park Enforcement Police. Uh, whether or not he knew it was legal, I'm not going to debate that. But when he got the summons, he was really dejected. You know, a lot of these guys, the vendors that receive summonses, they kind of consider it the cost of doing business. So I don't know if he's going to like take that as like, hey, maybe I should move along and not try this again. Or, if, you know, he's going to attempt it later. But we, he wasn't uh, summoned by the enforcement uh, guys. I mean, he's right. We do need public bathrooms. Betty and I are on a uh, task force dealing with public bathrooms, and he's right, but he can't just do that himself. And it also presents a security issue. I, I you know, we have Park Row that's been shut down. We have Liberty Street that's been shut down because of security issues. And, you know, any large box, any container on the bridge could present a security issue. So that's another problem. Okay, but really what we would like to discuss are the amount of vendors that are on basically located at the they're making a bottleneck at the entrance to the Brooklyn Bridge on the Manhattan side. They're also setting up along the fence. I don't know. We have again Matthew is here from the vendors project. Hi Matthew, thank you for coming. Um, we, you know, we want everybody to be able to do business and earn a living, but we need to also think about safety and security and whether this is really legal for them 
to be there and or and whether there's a better place to kind of situate them. So I, I don't know how we should really dis start the discussion. I guess one of the questions that we have, Officer Holman, is, and Andrew, you're also hearing what, what we're talking about. So uh, Officer Holman, first of all, are these, is it legal for these vendors to be here, be there? Uh, it's like, again, I don't, we don't, it's not ours, you know? So like typically like my job before I became a crime prevention officer, I was a conditions officer and I was heavily involved in like vendor uh, violations and fractions. I mean, the health department, we get involved. Uh, but the guys on the bridge without like giving a full examination, you know, and looking over their paperwork and whatnot, they need to have a DCA license, which should be properly displayed typically around the neck attached to their person. Uh, their their uh, displays like their tables can't be more than I believe eight feet and it can't be more than one level. Like you can't have a triple decker table to get more merchandise there. Uh, prices have to be displayed, you know, so people aren't being ripped off or anything like that. But uh, as, far, as far as I know, if they have those things in place, it is allowed. But don't don't quote me on that because again, like you know, I've never dealt with the Brooklyn Bridge enforcement. I don't I don't know 100% how that works. But I guess the issue, so you know, aside from whether they're legally there, is the amount of vendors that are there and the fact that they are impacting safety. And people's access to the bridge. Mm -hmm. So, I I understand that it's really the Brooklyn side, that it's their issue. And unfortunately, we could not get a representative here tonight. But uh, is there some way that your precinct can reach out to their precinct and discuss the issue, and see what we can do about thinning out the amount of vendors that are there? Well, I just, uh, I've been, I've been, my eyes have been going down, I've been going to my phone, but it's, it's related to this. So I've been talking to the, uh, I've been talking to Officer Ford and Officer Iordano, who are a bit more familiar with uh, the bridge enforcement itself. And it, it seems like the fifth may be capable of doing something, which is, you know, our neighbor in command over there in uh, Chinatown. Uh, I, we can definitely reach out to them and figure out if, like, who exactly can help us with this, like, portion. And that way we could, uh, you know, get involved and, and clear up the traffic. And that's another thing. I know no matter, you know, if it is legal 100%, you can't block um, pedestrian traffic. People have to have the free flow to walk up and down a sidewalk, bridge path, what, you know, what have you. So, um, yeah, I'll reach out and, you know, pass this along uh, to make sure whose it is, who can enforce it, and, you know, if they need anything from us. Thank you. Great. Uh, I'm going to take a couple of questions, one Betty and then Francis. Francis, go first. She's on committee. It doesn't matter. <laughs> well, I just wanted to highlight something that uh, Officer Holman just said, and the point I think really is not how many vendors there are, although indirectly it is, but how much space is left as a walkway for pedestrians. Because it's when their tables expand, I don't care if there are two of them, if they take up all the space and you can't get by, you can't get by. So I think the real issue is if, if some agreement can be made with enforcement, that a certain width has to be made available for the movement of people, not for businesses and other static groups. Thank Point you. well taken, Betty. Thank you. Francis, and then Matthew, we definitely want to hear from you, okay? Uh, Francis, you're muted. You're muted. Just an observation. Um, okay, am I still muted? Nope, we hear you. Okay, we hear you now. Um, uh, the the in addition to the size of the tables, the fact that you know there's congestion because people stop and they stand there and then it makes the walkway even narrower, you know? So um, that that's just another uh, pr problem that, that's a result of that whole situation. And I've noticed that there is a longer stretch of vendors on the, actually on the Brooklyn side than there is on the Manhattan side. Um, yeah, 
um but the manhattan side is 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 they they keep creeping up <laughs> and there's and there's more, more. So, oh, well, i can see on some days because i can see from my terrace and i can see some some days i can see them all the way lined up and then there's some days there's there's not that many people there's not that many vendors there but walking across the brooklyn bridge on the brooklyn side there there are a lot of vendors and i think that in terms of the congestion and people stopping and uh looking at the 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 items that are there just adds to the problem and that and i haven't really noticed i will take a better look of all those things you say that are that are necessary in terms of this there's, there's no i didn't see any prices you know because that's what i look for and say oh I, I wonder how much they're selling this for and how much they're selling that for and i don't see any big signs but that's my comment. <laughs> well, you know, I, I can take a preliminary walk at least on our side. You know, I can't I can't walk the entirety of the bridge into Brooklyn. I got stuff down here in the first precinct. But uh, tomorrow, I mean, my my uh, email address is miles m i l e s period Holman h o l m a n at nypd.org. Um, anything you notice, you know, please send over to me, and I'll I'll transmit it to the proper precincts. And we're at City Hall. Every almost every single day here in the first precinct for various things, so I can walk around the back, take a look, and see some of the things I know from my experience uh, dealing with those guys. Um, we would appreciate that. The uh, also the, the the times of day or maybe the days of the week. Like I was big on the Canal Street enforcement uh, for a while here, so I actually started to notice that like, hey, post Christmas time, the guys on Canal Street kind of disappear for a couple months. They go back home. And they show up again heavier uh, in March. They kind of are lighter Monday through Thursday, whereas the weekend it's kind of worth, you know, the risk with law enforcement to try and make a sale. You know, things like that that you notice that I don't know because, you know, I, I don't walk the bridge or, or have a terrace looking down on it. Let me know and I'll pass it along like, hey, Thursday and Friday, they have days that, you know, they know they're going to get the foot traffic. You guys might want to be out there enforcing it, you know, things like that. Okay, great. We we will do that. Um, uh, we'll come back to you, Officer Holman, in a minute. I just want to get Matthew in here. Thank you for coming, Matthew. And we are open to hearing anything that you would like to add to the conversation. Hi, can folks hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Sir. Great, great. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Matthew Shapiro, and I'm the legal director of the Street Vendor Project at the Urban Justice Center. Uh, I've been to uh, CB1 meetings, various committees before. And uh, it's always nice to come and, and talk to people. Um, the Street Vendor Project is a nonprofit organization that has over 2,000 members who are street vendors that work and live uh, all around the city. And we organize vendors to have their voices heard. We advocate at City Hall uh, for reform. And we provide direct legal assistance for street vendors who really have nowhere else to go because we are the only organization in the whole city that solely works with, with street vendors. Um, and I've been doing this work uh, representing street vendors in court and advising them on the laws and rules uh, since 2009. Um, and I know the issue on the Brooklyn Bridge really well. Our office is downtown at Rector Street. And I've been to the Brooklyn Bridge dozens of times over the past few years, including the last time with members of the DOT to do a walkthrough. Uh, so I'm very familiar, um, but I would love to go back again with any members of this committee that would want to join me for a walk. Uh, and we could directly sort of see uh, what the walk is like and how the vendors are affecting the pedestrian flow. So I have an open, uh, I would love to do that. I'll put my email address uh, in the chat here and we can schedule something uh, because the last time I was there, uh, yeah, there are vendors there. And uh, uh, ever since the bike lane was moved, you know, I haven't noticed any problem walking on the bridge. But I can understand at different times and different days, it might be more crowded than others. So I'd love to go there with people uh, when they think it's the most crowded and we can sort of see, you know, together uh, what it's like. Um, but that being said, uh, this is actually pretty timely because uh, uh, just a few days ago, vendors have come to, come to us and told us that they're being entirely prevented from setting up uh, on the bridge. This is just over the last few days. The police are sitting there and preventing them from working. And folks know, you know, street vendors are, are these are all immigrant uh, uh, folks from immigrant populations who were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, really had no business for many years. Uh, and now they can't work at all. Uh, so, yes, there are rules they have to follow. Uh, the officer was right. Uh, general vendors can only take up eight by 
three feet of space. Uh, if you're selling merchandise, you have to have a DCA license, but many of the vendors sell artwork uh, and First Amendment material, uh, which does not require a license. And there is one food vendor who sells hot dogs who does have a valid permit and a valid license. Uh, and even them, uh, even they are prevent have been prevented from working entirely uh, over the past few days. And remember, this is their livelihood, folks. They, they don't have other jobs that they can just do. <laughs> They've been doing this for years, uh, sometimes over 10 years, uh, and they rely on this money uh, to feed their families. Um, so we're going to be working with them uh, to reestablish their spots. Uh, we understand if there are if there are regulatory issues, if there are rules such as the distance and the uh, placement and the size that are not being enforced, those need to be addressed because pedestrian flow is paramount. There needs to be enough space for people to walk. And especially since the bike lane was removed, uh, we believe that there's enough room for both, uh, enough room for the vendors, uh, especially since general vendors can only take up three feet of width space. So there should be enough room for the vendors and enough room for pedestrians to walk. Um, so I will be, you know, we're gonna be working with the vendors in the near future on this. And again, I'd love to go there with any members who want to meet me there. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But uh, thank you all for for listening and for thank having you for me. Coming. Matthew, so, so interesting. Uh, do you know which precinct, the officers from which precinct are preventing them from setting up? No, uh, I don't. Um, uh, I saw a couple summonses that were issued by the Parks Department, funny enough, be uh, even though those are wrong because the bridge itself is not Parks Department property, that's DOT property. The, the space just past the bridge into Manhattan is Parks Department property, so those summonses will get thrown out. But I believe that NYPD also issued summonses, and they have, what I heard just today from some of our members, they have two police cars stationed there preventing anyone from setting up uh, and that's a, a real, really big problem, and that's gonna, you know, we're gonna be, we're gonna be working with the vendors on that real so soon. You don't know which precinct they're from. Uh, it, honestly, I just got the call today, so uh, uh, okay. we're we're so, we're gonna be figuring this out. But yeah, I don't know which precinct it was. It might be interesting. Officer Holman has, you know, offered to go by and look tomorrow. It might be. Yeah, interesting. The vendors won't be there because they're they're not allowed to be being set up. So uh, uh, that you know. It's also going to be rainy tomorrow, so I'm not sure they would be there anyways. Yeah, I was going to say it might be rainy tomorrow, but it might be interesting for you two to exchange information and check in and see. Yeah, well, uh, since Officer Holman was was right in that they are allowed to sell on the bridge, there's no restriction for selling on the bridge. But so that that leads me to believe that it's not his precinct that's doing this because he right. seems to have the right information, but another precinct or some other officers seem to have the wrong information. So. Uh, yeah, we're going to be working on this real soon, and I'm sure we'll be in contact with whoever, with whatever officers are there uh, uh, at the bridge. Yeah, if you uh, wouldn't mind, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry again. Yeah, we don't we don't enforce the bridge. Like the first precinct, you know, we we deal with all our other stuff. Um, I'd offer just a look to give you guys, you know, what I saw. But uh, it seems that uh, Matthew knows, and hopefully, you know, I assume you're sharing that information with the guys on the bridge. Like, hey, you know, stay within these, you know rules so there's no issues but yeah we don't enforce so i, I seriously doubt first precinct cops stop people from setting on the bridge right okay so talking the manhattan side of the bridge yeah this is the manhattan side uh the, the vendors that we know that are our members sell on the manhattan side I, i'm honestly not as familiar with the brooklyn side but i'm also happy to go there and check that out with anyone that's interest that's interested as well but we have several members that sell either a first amendment material or, or other stuff uh, uh, on the on the Manhattan side. Okay, so we are interested when you find out, you know, who's which officers from which precinct are preventing the because we don't want to prevent them from obviously from making a living, but we'd like to you know be sure that there's safety maintained on the bridge and there's access maintained on egress and access and exit in the case there's an emergency. And also a bit of security. So, so, you know, we're, we're interested in this. Desi, are you talking to us? Because if you are, you're muted. Nope, Desi's just talking. Okay. So, uh, I don't know where else we can take this conversation at the moment. Is there anyone from the committee that has any questions, any observations, any comments? I do have one other question uh, in, in terms of uh, time restrictions. Are they, um, uh, is there a period of time, like 
between eight and four that they could be there? Or is there anything like that? There's no restrictions on time. So uh, New York City has a, uh, has dozens of street restrictions where vendors can and cannot set up all over the city. Um, there's a whole list and there's different lists for food vendors and general merchandise vendors. Uh, the Brooklyn Bridge is not included in those restrictions. So therefore there are no time, there are no time restrictions. Although, you know, I can't imagine the vendors selling there at two in the morning. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure they follow a relatively normal schedule but um, there's no time restrictions uh, on the Brooklyn Bridge. Listen, anyone from the public that's here about this and would like to say anything or ask a question? You heard the chair, members of the public. Now's the time to raise your hand. Does anyone have a question for, for anyone on the panel? Pat, I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, so Betty has a question. Except for Betty. Betty. Thanks. I was on to mention because Rosa had brought up with me that she was concerned about there were two. They looked like lazy Susans. There's rotating things put out on the bridge by a private business, so not street vendors. And if they're taking photographs, where you can get a 360 degree photo of yourself on the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah, so I mean, it's hard to believe the kinds of businesses just going out there on the bridge and. They had used hooked into the electricity on the bridge. So you can see the extension cords and I was wondering if people were still seeing them there as well. <laughs> well, Matthew has made an offer for people to go and walk the bridge with him. So we're going to get his contact information and well, these are street them. vendors. You said these were or were not. They're not. They are just by themselves. Oh, okay. Again, we've got so a like lot the of porta potties there, you know. Spirits. Right. Yeah. All right. So I think at this point, oh, oh Andrew, you're here and you've heard some of these is this issue. It's not necessarily something that needs to go to the mayor's office, but you see what we're we're interested in and, and what we're discussing. So that's good. And uh I think we'll just leave it at this moment. We'll leave it here. We'll get Matthew's information if anyone would like to walk the bridge with him. I know that I'm going to get um Rosa connected to you, Matthew, because Rosa is working on the Brooklyn Bridge. I don't know if you know her. If you met Rosa Chang, who is working on the Brooklyn Bridge Parks project, she's trying to get so she's interested in all things Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> that, is that part of the redesign, re redesign contest that happened or? Well, it's not part of the contest, but she's doing her best to get a park there under the bridge, get the, uh, get the stairs cleaned up, get oh, right. the row cleaned up, and you know, anything and everything that surrounds and is on the bridge she is interested in. So I will get that her. That sounds great. I'd love Matthew. to talk to her. Exactly. Great, great. All righty. So thank you again, Matthew, for coming. You're welcome to stay. If not, Happy New Year. And thank you for coming, and we'll be in touch. Great. Thank you all. Have a good night. <laughs> you too. All right. So we're going to move on. Uh, the next thing, okay, is Joel, is Joel here? Uh, uh, I, 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 I haven't seen Joel. I, I would recommend, uh, because we have Andrew, if we could, uh, flip, uh, this item and the mayor's new mental health initiative sure. item. Definitely. Um, and, but while we have officer Holman, um, it may be good to also, it's not on the agenda, but if wherever you think, um, a public safety update would be germane to the larger conversation. Uh, well, Andrew, are you rushing? No, Officer Holman, please, if you want to go for now, it go for it. Yeah, they kind of uh, yeah. Thank hand you. in I, hand. I think, I think at this junction is like pretty much the end of uh of me. Like you know, I don't, I don't uh, relate to the rest of the thing on subjects. Uh, as far as the first precinct is concerned, uh. Biggest issue right now, I'd say, are uh, I'd probably say burglaries. I mean, they're they're low actually compared from this time last year. But you know, like with our our businesses here, um, basic locking your doors, uh, and the burglaries extend to apartments with more than anything's package theft. You know, make sure your super has the building locked properly. Uh, if you do have packages in your lobby, bring them upstairs as soon as possible. Especially if it means something to you, you know, I, we get that some people, uh, will order something and, you know, I, I have like pre-workout that comes to my house every month. I don't think about it. 
that's not that big a deal. Um, so I might leave that on my front steps, but at the same time that that invites someone to come in, you know, to break that lock to get someone else's property. So, you know, even when you, when you look out for your, you know, your PlayStation 5 or your, you know, $5,000 handbag, you uh, you may not look out for the little things. So you should always be aware of that stuff and, and bring it in as quickly as possible. Um, uh, we have uh, 14 new cops, uh, brand new rookies. They're on foot posts out in Soho. They work anywhere between 11 uh, a.m. to 7, and then they flip, and they work from, uh, I believe, 7.30 at night to about 4 o'clock in the morning. So we're using them to deal with burglaries. We're using them for our retail theft in Soho, which is our biggest driver uh, of larcenies here. Uh, that's about it. You know, we're, we're trying to stay on top of the smoke shops the best we can, but again, that's a sheriff's department. Um, but I just got an email a week, you know, from the, the borough of Manhattan South asking for any updates because these guys are, they're popping up left, right, and center. So we want to be able to, to log those smoke shops and then forward them to uh, sheriff's department if they need to take enforcement. And uh, that's it. Anybody have any questions for me before I log out? No? Anyone from the public? Listen. I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Okay, I just want to say again, January 26th, which is a Thursday at 6 o'clock on Zoom, first precinct council meeting, so that Officer Holman will probably be there along with the oh. other officers and Captain Smith. And uh, please come, please attend. If, if Even if you don't have any issues, just to hear, it's great to go to the first precinct council our police officers are doing a great job. They're doing the best to keep us safe and they like to see you and hear your input. So thank you, Officer Holman. Please be safe. Happy New okay. Year. Thank you for coming. Can anybody attend this meeting? The council? Oh, yeah, it's open to the public. It is a link. Some There's a Zoom link and, and we will have it and we'll get it out to you. Yeah, I sent it out. It's in the chat. It's in the chat. It's in the chat. But 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 Diane, feel free to email me a request for it if you want an email, and I'll, you know, do it if you do it now. I'll have a response to you because I have it right in front of me before the end of the meeting. Okay, great. Thank you, Officer Holman. Be safe. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, have sir. A good night. All right. I just uh, texted Joel, and I don't see a response, so I don't know if he forgot. But this was the item that he brought up and wanted uh, wanted us to discuss. So we're going to go ahead without him. So it is about the um, is it actually signed into law or is it just a proposed law that they? It's 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 it's, it's been introduced to the city council, Pat. Uh, I mm -hmm. so today I, I spoke with. Um, Council Member Chris Marte's legislative director mm -hmm. and, and got a, a, a full readout of what the status is and what the law, you know, a lot more of what the law can do and it can't do at this point. But right now it's it's been introduced. There's been a hearing. Uh, the hearing has, there was a, a lot of, it was a very well attended hearing uh, with a lot of people making points uh, on both sides. Um, Councilmember Marte signed on as a co-sponsor. The bill's primary sponsor uh, of the uh, will be taking um, amendments now, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of these amendments are being generated based on what was heard at the hearing. Uh, and then once all the amendments are in, and he, the sponsor feels like that there's enough support, then a, a, an updated draft will be released. And that will be the draft upon which the city council will be voting. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's think, you know what that's I where think, it is. Okay, I think since Joel is not here and he brought it up that maybe we and 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 it's not nothing's happening yet that we might want to move this to another meeting. What do you think about that, Lucian? Yeah, I think that's I think that that's wise. Um, I'll just say. Um, between now and a future month when this is heard again, mm -hmm. uh, I would only advocate for those who have any strong feelings either way to email their council member uh, to make sure that that council member is considering 
uh, uh, what amendments that they would like them to make to make this more palatable in whatever view they have. Uh, but this is this is a kind of a crucial time whether you want to see the law's language strengthened or more flexibility for landlords, whichever position you fall, uh, this is the time to speak directly to your representation in the in the city council. Okay, so I think we'll just table this this item. And after Andrew has discussed with us the mental health initiative, if we want to go back, circle back and just have a quick discussion for those of you who don't understand what this item is, we could do that. But in the meantime, let's let Andrew so that he can have a nice long robust discussion with us and let him present and then and so that he can also go and have an evening. <laughs> so hi Andrew again. Thank you for coming. Do you want to tell us about the mayor's proposal for this new mental health initiative? Yeah, thanks so much for asking me to speak on this. Uh, so November of last year, the mayor announced a plan to create a culture of engagement for unsheltered New Yorkers with severe mental illness. Um, it's received a lot of press. I'm sure you have seen much of this. Um, but we want to say first and foremost that we as the city have a moral obligation to lead with compassion and care and that we can do much more to help those among us with severe mental crisis, um, even when they are unable to, by no fault of their own, recognize their own needs. We still want to have a plan that ensures that we don't fail to deliver to our most vulnerable. And to that end, the mayor announced this new initiative with Department of Mental Health, FDNY EMS, and NYPD, which includes two main things. It creates an expedited and step-by-step -step process for involuntary transportation for individuals in severe crisis, and states explicitly that it's appropriate to use this process only when an individual appears to be severely mental ill and unable to meet their basic needs. And we've included enhanced training for outreach workers, emphasizing the need and what those basic need interventions are. This is including engagement strategies to try with before there's a removal of the individual and transport. And the training for this has already begun underway with some of the NYPD professionals in partnership with FDNY and the Department of Mental Health. And so with that, those mental health teams and those specialized intervention teams, they're gonna be made up of clinicians, people who have formerly experienced some homelessness or mental illness, as well as our FDNY and NYPD professionals. And these specialized teams are going to have the training and expertise, and most importantly, the sensitivity needed to handle somebody who's experiencing severe mental illness. And this is all going to be happening in real time to consider the potential response for individuals with the mental health crisis, mental health crisis and has already become operational in early of 2023. In partnership with this um, robust outreach program, we're also going to be seeking legislative agenda with the city and the state. So we're going to be working with state partners to write the basic needs standards for involuntary intervention into state law. And this could codify court precedent to help make it more widely understood. Additional legislation that the city has announced is requiring hospital evaluators to consider all relevant factors, such as treatment history and recent behavior, also allowing a broader range of mental health professionals to perform hospital evaluations and serve on these mobile crisis teams. We're also requiring Kendra's Law eligibility screenings in hospitals to ensure that our most vulnerable New Yorkers are getting treatment. And we really want to make sure to say what this plan is not. This plan does not call for sweeps of people living on our streets with mental illness or people residing in public places. This does not expand the powers of city personnel to transport individuals without hospital evaluation or mental health evaluations. This does not increase reliance on police to address unsupported mental, severe mental health illness. And it's certainly not the answer to fixing our mental health system. We have a long way to go before we do reach an amicable solution. Um, so that's the base, the base outline of what we have so far. The program has been activated for just a few weeks beginning this year. We don't yet have any quantifiable data to share with you, but we are seeing that the 
batch of NYPD candidates in the upcoming academy. They're getting training in this mental health initiatives, as well as some of the more experienced officers already, already in the service. And we're going to hopefully broaden this out and really make sure this is something that we have in real-time response, and we're making sure that we're tailoring this program to best meet the needs that we're identifying as the program continues. Um, and with that, I'll open up to any questions that the committee and the public may have. So as the chair, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions first. So Andrew, can you just walk us through how an actual engagement might happen? So I, as a, a, you know, a person who's walking down the street, if I see someone who I think needs help, do I call 311? Do I call the precinct? Who do, who do I call? How does it start? So, yeah, always you want to make sure that you're calling 311. That's going to be the best place to to do so. If somebody is just what you perceive as experiencing homelessness, obviously, if somebody is a danger to themselves or somebody is a danger to another individual, we do encourage you to call 911. First and foremost, they're going to be the, the main responding agencies. But with this, we're going to flag that through 311, and it's going to be a multi-agency approach. And it's going to be individuals from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, individuals from the FDNY EMS, as well as NYPD, and clini clinical uh, clinicians, excuse me, who are going to be responding. And I'm not sure exactly right now, you know, what the the who is going to be the first person responding to this situation. I think it might be on a case by case basis. But as I said earlier, there are going to be some intervention techniques that are being taught to people. How can we triage the situation right here before it gets into a situation where we need to transport somebody to the hospital? <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's going to be a series of um, like questions. There's going to be a series of just different interactions between this group before um, the situation happens. And then ultimately, they're going to encourage the people to, on their own accords, come with them and seek the mental help. And if it is continued to show that they are resisting and they are, be, they truly are a detriment to themselves, then um, the NYPD, in partnership with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, are going to encourage that person and then escort them to, to a hospital for further evaluation. And then from there, it will be up to the hospital on the course of treatment for that individual. Well, I, I'm a little confused because isn't that kind of what happens now? Maybe without all the personnel involved, but isn't that kind of what happens now? That I, if the person is, the, the police will respond. And I thought that they had some sort of clinician, some person who had some mental health experience go out with them and have a discussion with the, the person engage with the person and then if they are clearly a danger to themselves or to other people that they are encouraged to go in if not then they have to be forcibly taken in is that kind of what's going on now or am i mistaken it is no no no. it's very similar to what's going on now this is just a more robust training and focus on mental health where we're going to prioritize that and all officers are going to have that training and the responding people are going to be the more mental health focused. So right now there was a, or excuse me, at the end of the last administration, there was a program that was implemented in a small area of East Harlem called Be Heard. And what this was, was FDNY EMT mental health professionals responding at NYPD's request to severely mental illness, rather than NYPD being the number one responsive agency. So through that program, they identified a need for more compassion and understanding when dealing with these type of severe mental health issues. So this kind of overarching training and understanding and more focus on the mental health broad in all our responding agencies, um, is we think is going to make a, a big impact on helping people get the help that they may or may not feel they need. So it sounds like the main difference is more of an emphasis on retraining and understanding mental health and being more sensitive to and less force being involved. And also, it's not only homeless people, it's also engaging with people who are housed, but may be having an episode, correct? Correct. Okay. So 
I may have some more questions, but we're going to move along because I don't want to hog all the questions. So Desi and then Diane Stein. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for joining us. I wonder if there is or had there been any plans for similar to what we had with the coronavirus uh, public education campaign, like when we had the commissioner, uh, you know, talk about the ways in which to prevent or the kinds of things that would um, happen with the rollout of vaccines, because I think it's probably beneficial to make sure that everybody understands what's happening because I think there has been such trepidation and pushback on the idea of scooping people up and putting them in the hospital. Yeah, Desi, I think that's a great idea. And I think we as the city owe it to our residents that to explain what this initiative is on a more broader base scale. And I think that we can certainly do a better job of doing that. And I think we, you know, when I go back and, and share my notes with some of the other commissioners, I'm definitely going to emphasize kind of that need to clearly outline what this means for somebody who is experiencing that, or somebody who may have a sibling who might have severe mental illness. So I think that's really important that we do provide that, uh, that really, really impeccable education on what this program is and how it's going to impact our, our residents. Because as Desi said, you know, there are a lot of people in, in communities that are afraid to call the police because of past experience, not right. just their experience, experiences we've seen on the news that have ended, unfortunately, in the death of the person who really needed the help. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Desi, good point. Thank you. Sure. Diane Stein. Oh. I had two questions. Um, one uh, was when you say they encourage people to to go to, I guess, to go with them to the hospital, and if they res re how do they handle it if the person resists? That's question number one. How did how do they bring them to the hospital if they don't want to go? And the second question is, will the hospitals do they have the resources to handle uh, these situations? Or is it going to be the case where they're just going to be back on the street with no, no support? And, and the same thing happen all over again. Yeah, so I can't speak exactly to what level of force may or may not be used in getting somebody to come involuntarily off the street. Um, I have yet to see that. And I think it would do me a lot to better speak about this program, have it being able to understand what the parameters of that are. So I'm going to have to come back to you on exactly what that will look like. Um, and would you mind just repeating the second part for me? Um, Sorry. Um, if they, let's say now, now the second part is they go to the hospital either voluntarily or involuntarily. Will the do you know? Have you have they has there been some coordination with these hospitals? Um, do, will they have the resources to be able to handle these situations and, um, and, prov and will these people get on some ongoing support or will they just be let back on this? You know, I don't know how many beds hospitals have, how long they keep, them, what kind of treatment they'll be getting inside once they're in the hospital. And then when they're out of the hospital, is, is the same situation going to happen all over again? They'll, will they have some kind of ongoing support or monitoring, you know, in the hospital. And... Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so first and foremost, the mayor is working on legislation um, in the city here that will allow for more medical professionals to perform these psychiatric and mental health evaluations. Um, right now, I believe it is just uh, doctors who are able to do so, but lowering that barrier to nurse practitioners or registered nurses, I think would allow much more, um, many more people and, and alleviate some of the, the burdens on some of the hospitals. And then I think what we're also requesting is that kind of that 24 to 72 hour hold that a lot of people are given, as you said, is kind of just seen as a revolving door. And we are going to be seeking more robust medical treatment, long-term treatment, how we can get people to follow up, how we can get people into support groups, how we can get people into long-term stable housing, first and foremost. Um, and 
and really, really make sure that they're not a detriment to themselves or their individuals. If somebody doesn't have health insurance, we're going to be working to get them enrolled in health insurance and make sure that they're taking advantage of all that there is to all, all the tools that are, are available to them. Um, so again, I think I'm going to have to follow up a little bit more on the exact legislation and what those what that says on kind of how we are going to be treating these individuals. But I know that there has been an emphasis to give them more treatment than has been done in the past. Thank you. Uh, Marianne and then Mitch. Thank you. So I'm attending this meeting partly because I have a relationship with a group called Open Hearts Initiative that does outreach to homeless people. And through them, I've been listening in uh, to monthly meetings, taking notes to share back with them of a group of medical practitioners who've been concerned about how to, how to maintain the health of homeless people. If you have a wound and you're living on the streets, is that wound gonna heal? And what, what does that then evolve into? So because of these two connections, I wanna share uh, as much as possible of what you said, Andrew, accurately with them. So when you spoke at the beginning, you had a really clear presentation of what, what the city wants to do and what, what you don't wanna do. And if you have that written, I would love to have a copy of that to share. And then secondly, um, of course, some of the people who've already spoken have pointed out ways that this could go wrong. You know, the people who might resist or the, you know, are the resources there. And, and so I just want to back up what they're saying that, you know, from what I hear from the medical professionals who discuss the health of homeless people, both mental and physical, they are very concerned about this, that, that the resources are not going to be there. So uh, to the extent you're going further to address it or looking for legislation or maybe funding um, to, to help the people who need the help, because the care and compassion you started with is, is what we all want, but it, it all you know, can be completely different when it comes to the actual practice of what we're hoping for. So thank you and I hope it all yeah. can work well. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Marianne, I, I will certainly, I'll share this with Lucian so he can share this with you, you. some of the information. And I just want to uh, repeat that this is not the answer. You know, this is a, another step towards the answer. And mm -hmm. it's going to take a lot of work and mm -hmm. it's going to take a lot of conversations with people like you, medical professionals, you know, people experiencing the severe mental illness. So we are on a long journey to really see this through. And I think this mayor really has the emphasis and the the know how to to really see this through. Right. And I just want to put a, a little pitch out there because it is coming up later this week is the hope count, which I'm not sure if you are all familiar with is each year the city does a census of individuals living on the street right. and it is called the hope count and it's a very very big robust effort organized by the department of homeless services it includes lots of public private partners who go out overnight and really make sure we can get an accurate accounting of our homeless population and that really helps us focus resources to these areas and then one step further the following week we have the youth count which is where the city will count runaway and homeless youth, which are often much more difficult to identify. And I'll be able to share some information with Lucian as well, if anybody would like to get involved with this. But now is a really great time if you are interested in this homeless population, if you are interested in really just volunteering your, your time, something really worthwhile, this is a great cause. Um, so yeah, I'll make sure to put that in the chat for Lucian as well. Thank you. Thanks. Andrew, I'm just going to uh, need to jump the line really quick. I'm sorry, Pat. Andrew, mm -hmm. for any opportunities for members of CB1 and the public to volunteer for the Hope Count as has been possible in years past, if they're still doing that, and if you need more people to cover and, and uh, census uh, lower Manhattan, uh, please send me that information if you'd like. And 
I will make sure the board members have access to it in case anyone from our public or the members uh, uh, would like to help out. Great, thanks so much, Lucian. I'll make sure to share that with you. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm um, Mitch, go ahead. Hi, Pat. Yes, Andrew. Uh, Basically, taking you at your word of everything that you said, it's uh, I'm going to double down on you know Denise uh, Desi's uh, recommendation uh, because you know some of the stuff that I've read and heard is kind of like from the other side as far as you know not wanting to uh, too much of a power thing, and what you have said today is makes perfect sense. And the other thing is besides getting the word out, letting people know that. You know, family members that maybe in the immigration status, you know, wouldn't make a difference. Everything is like confidential. That might be something to emphasize for people that are scared to call. Number two, I'm not sure you're you're too young to have been there, but are you familiar with the Billy Box case from 1987? Yes. Okay, so I've actually just pulled up the article because I remember it like it was yesterday. I pulled up the article from 1987 from the New York Times and. It might be a good idea for you and some of the other people that, you know, working on this for the city to maybe study some of the mistakes that the city made at that point so as not to blow this thing because there probably will be some legal pushback against it. And one of the things in the, in, on, in the New York Times article that I was just re reading that uh, Billy, uh, the Jocelyn Brown, who, who that's what the, the, the lady from the Upper East Side that was defecating on herself and running in and out of traffic on, naked in the winter, her four sisters actually claim that the judge Littman, who, who who refused to let her be involuntary, get help at the at the psychiatric hospital, they claim that he was racist because he wouldn't let his wife or mother defecate on herself naked in the winter, and they were begging for help because they had known that she had been diagnosed at a younger age as chronic schizophrenia and and drug abuse. So it might be a good idea. If there was any way, if there was any ID on some of the people to maybe reach out to some family members, uh, even if they had been, you know, long estranged for many years, to to, to get like a, some backstories, which might help the homeless person in some way. And and uh, these are just some ideas because uh, I remember that case, and unfortunately, you know, uh, that led to a lot of other other homeless people that were danger to themselves and not being able to get the help that they needed. Yeah, I think, you know, we're really looking to put forth this full community wide approach and, you know, having those conversations, speaking with family members is really going to go a long way. So I'm definitely going to encourage that the individuals who are working on these these policies and putting them into play are familiar with um, some of the previous cases and instances, not only here in New York, but elsewhere where we've. Right. But I think this was the big case where this was the big one where they 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 kind of tore the whole thing down as, mm -hmm. as and I think after that, you know, uh, I think the city lost the will to to try to help people that were a danger to themselves with, you know, and, and, and then sometimes they went overboard with just the cops just use, viewing them as criminals. So uh, I just wanted to make that that point and uh, I hope it works. No, Mitch, so much. On what you're saying to help Andrew out there, there was some follow up in the Daily News on December 4th of last year. So you might want to check that out too. There's two uh, article on December 4th and an article on December 7th regarding the Billy Boggs mental health case, homelessness and daily right. news, daily news story. Francis, and, would you share those links in the in yeah. the chat, please? It's, if you guys go like the original November 13th, 1987, New York Times, homeless woman sent to hospital under Koch plan is ordered freed. And that's like all the information like verbatim from the actual day that it happened. Well, you can, again, it's easier. Send it an email as you always ask or send it in the chat. Okay. I'll, I'll send you an email, Pat, so you can forward it. So that's easier for me. Okay, that's fine. In I, the meantime, I, I was trying to put it in the chat. I sent it to Lucian. So you okay, great. The chat. Thanks. Thanks, Desi. Mm -hmm. um, Diane Stein, you had your hand up again. And and Mitch, if you're done, I'm sorry. Take your hand down. I'm sorry. Yes, I will okay. put my hand down. I Thank apologize. you. That's all right. Uh, just a comment. Speaking of, uh, you know, hope they say 
people who are mentally ill and homeless being treated like criminals. Um, Rikers Island is full, you know, and, and a lot of the, the jail system is full of people who are, have mental illness and are not being treated for it. And they're resulting in a lot of suicides. Definitely true, Diane. Um, all right, anyone else have a question for Andrew? Would like to make a comment? Any uh, we have uh, one comment? hand up in the attendees, SM. Who is it? Uh, uh, just uh, the two letters, SM. Hello, SM. Would you identify yourself, please? You're unmuted now, SM. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So, um, I also volunteer with open hearts as well, but um, I'm also somebody with a medical background. I used to practice internal medicine within New York city. So I've actually been pay paying a lot of attention to this and I have to say that what's being. What was proposed or discussed is a very different interpretation of how this would be applied compared to when I've heard the mayor talking about this in that specifically we already have laws as we talked about that allows you to involuntarily commit somebody for up to 72 hours um, if, they're a, 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 if they're a danger to themselves or a danger to others. What the mayor specifically said is even if they're not a danger, he would like the ability to involuntarily commit somebody. Um, I think that, that that's concerning to me, but I understand that even if somebody's not a, a huge danger to themselves or others, there are people who are so mentally Ill, Ill who can't take care of their basic needs, and I understand they need to get them help. But the biggest concern I have is that this doesn't really solve the real problem, which is long term care, because if you talk to a lot of these people, their family members will tell you that it's a revolving door. They go into the hospital, they get, um, you know, involuntarily committed, and then there's no real long term care for them. And it's just an extension of the problem that we have right now and that we don't have affordable housing and housing services for people with chronic mental illness and who are unhoused. In fact, you know, in the hospital, the way it works is that in order to hold somebody for 72 hours, there's a law that dictates that they have to be deemed, you know, a danger to themselves or to others. And then after 72 hours, if you can't say that, then you're sort of stuck. And if you don't have a place for them to go to, it doesn't solve anything. And that, and I, and I just worry about the focus on, on this. And I just read an article today in the New York Times uh, where Michael Katz, who runs uh, the, uh, <coughs> the hospital association in New York City said, this program ideally is only meant to address about a thousand home unhoused people. So we're talking about a tiny segment. And so it doesn't address the bigger problem, but I, I just, I, you know, hospitals are already stressed. Doctors are burnt out. I just very much worry about sending people in without adequate outpatient services and supportive housing, which is really the need. And I've been involved in lots of cases where we knew that they were just going to be on the streets again, but we had no other option because they didn't meet criteria to be in an inpatient setting. And so I just haven't heard enough Preach. that they're going to do long term um, follow up, which is really the in every time a very severely mentally ill person has committed a crime and you talk to the family, what did they say? It's a revolving door. They've been in and out of the hospital. Getting them in is not the issue. It's the support and the support of housing that they need long term. And I haven't heard anything about that. Andrew did say that though, but yes, that is yeah, yeah. no I just, plan. I just want to emphasize, you know, this is not the solution. You know, I've been very clear about that. And I want to continue to have these conversations. If you want to set up an opportunity to talk with me and you know really go into detail on what you think could be different glad to to sit down and have oh. that conversation with you because you know i'm not a medical professional okay i am you know maybe experiencing a little mental illness from time to time but <laughs> you know i'm not i'm not oh one Andrew. of these individuals is a detriment to myself so it takes these conversations for me to to go back and be able to put forth oh, okay. you know really robust policy recommendations so please, so you know, I do. Give... I, I do have a group of physicians who are hoping to be supportive because obviously we don't want anybody suffering on the streets and we don't want the prison to serve as our biggest mental health facilities for long term care, which is what's happening. 
But I would love to invite you to a conversation with these other medical providers who very much want to make sure that if this is going to happen, that we do it right and we do whatever we can to make sure that their long term care right. needs are also met. That's great. If you would give yeah. your contact information, please. Are you talking yeah. to me? Yes. Your SSM, I, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, it says the public chat has been disabled. I was going to text you I, my I'm gonna, email. Address. I'm going to send you my email. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, you don't want to make it yeah. public. You just okay. wanted to get to Andrew. So, yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Oh, SSM, thank, thank you, you so that much. Would be fabulous. I'm sure that thank you do. so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming and, and, and offering up your, your expertise. Thank you. Pat, I sent you the link to your email if you want to share it with other people. Oh, that, that you to my email? Okay, like I'm Miss Technical, you know? If Mimi was having trouble and she's Miss Technical, you know me. No. A Luddite, next to being a Luddite. So anyway, we'll get it, we'll get it out there, Mitch. Thanks for sending it to me. Is there anyone else who would like to uh, say anything to Andrew, make any suggestions, ask any questions? If not, we're going to let Andrew go Pat, and have the rest of his evening. Yes, Lucian. I just want to say that uh, Andrew has um, uh, helped us out with about like eight issues over the past week. Yeah. Uh, did a lot of heavy lifting, so I just wanted to take this public forum to to thank him for for everything. Thank you so it goes much. From for getting us specialty contacts at One Police Plaza to yeah. you know uh, uh, making sure that everything's safe with those porta potties. Uh, uh, Andrew's been there. So uh, okay. thanks uh, for, for all and that. Jared and Thomas are like so happy they left this meeting knowing that they're going to have a meeting with you. So thank you for offering that up and any other solutions and answers to our questions. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it's really, it's my pleasure. And, you know, I, I am no longer the Manhattan Borough Director, but, you know, CB1 will always play a, a very special place in my heart. Um, but, you know, any questions, concerns, do not hesitate to continue to reach out. Ask me to come. Thank Let me talk on so what's much. going on. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. All, All right. right. And, so. and just, just one last thing, Pat. This is a good opportunity just to say the new Manhattan Borough Director is Robin Forrest. So everyone oh. knows. I didn't know that. Everyone knows Robin Forrest on. on uh, Robin on didn't Forrest. mention that to me. Yeah. So that's, that's a good time to announce that. So. Uh, don't text Robin's personal phone on for, for oh, come on. business. Uh, <laughs> we will we will make sure that uh, uh, we have co ways to contact Robin, but uh, don't don't uh, ring her her phone off the the hook at eight p.m. Well, Robin uh, is part uh, of my book group, so I'm calling uh, her. <laughs> the book group is sacred, Pat. <laughs> Andrew, thank you, thank you, thank you. Happy New Year. We appreciate everything that you have done in the past, are going to do in the future, and have done tonight. <laughs> so Thank we you will, all. We will look forward to working with you with um, the Holland Tunnel issue. And on that note, please go in and have a great rest of your evening. We appreciate it. And I'm going to turn back to the committee and say, if they're, you know, I always love for the committee members to be the ones to bring issues to uh, to the committee. I think Frances has her hand up. Well, I think I posted some stuff in the chat, so I think I was. No, able... I'm not even finding where the chat is. Copy, paste, <laughs> and do all of that. So I think there are some articles in the chat. I don't see anything in the chat. Well, I'll ask Lucian because you know, again, you guys know how I am. I can't. Do this. I can't do yeah. this. Francis, I, I posted, I pasted the link that you said, the the Daily News article, right? And then also the um, I have a Wikipedia entry that someone okay. that you sent as well. Okay. Um, so Terrific. everyone, please take some time to read through all this material. I think mm -hmm. it's been a great conversation. Boy, Thanks, Marianne. Thank you for coming. I know that you sure you don't want to become a public member for the Quality of Life Committee. You're welcome. And maybe I'm being drawn this way. I don't know. Oh, we'll we'll see how it plays out. <laughs> well, you're welcome. To come unrelated, anytime. unrelated announcement. Community board applications are open. Uh, uh, community everybody. board. So everyone in the public, uh, community board uh, membership applications are open through the borough president's office. So. Uh, any members of the public here, let me know if you need the uh, link. All right. And everyone, just if whatever your religious affiliation is or not, just send out good words into the universe on behalf of Kathy Gusta and her family. 
Um, as you, most of you know, she passed on Saturday and she was a long time member of this committee actually and had to step down because of health reasons. We, she will be missed. She was a great part of our community. So anything else anybody would like to say? A really nice, they did a really nice long uh, tribute to her in the Broad Street. I mean, oh, it was really, really very in depth and very nice. Okay, I'm gonna have to um, try to find that. I've read it, Lucian. Maybe if I get it to you, you could share it, or even yeah. put it on the on the community board website that anybody oh, yeah. who's worked with her would yeah, find. That would be great. Thanks. Yeah, I'll send it to you. all the boards have have gotten the link to the broadcast article. Okay, all the board great. Members yeah, it was. Them. Thank you. She Thanks. was a sweet, steady. She was a lovely, lovely, lovely woman. You know, just aside from all the great work she did, she was just a lovely right. person. Just yeah. She will be missed. So on that note, everyone, please go have the, enjoy the rest of your evening. Be safe. If you think of any other items you'd like to bring and put on the agenda, please let Lucian and I know. And um, I'll see you guys at the full board meeting or some of you tomorrow night at the executive meeting. You know, it's open to the public. You're all welcome to come. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you for all the great input. See you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Lucian, as always, thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> thank you, Pat. Thank job. you, committee. Thank you. We were glad that your son joined us for a little while. Yes, you saw that. Yeah, I, I didn't stop the recording so I could get that on. So that's in the public record now. Thank you. Thank Let's you. Start them young so they get engaged. All right. All right. Appreciate that, Pat. We'll try to get them on more often. Great.